Welcome to our event uh, on the geopolitics of the 2022 FIFA World Cup in Qatar. Um, thank you for being here Thursday evening, cold, almost snowy. And then we have Dr. Chris Cruz from the International Studies Department, whose talk is called Foul Play, Football Hooligans and the Politics of Justice. How's your so. today? Woo! Woo okay, so. Um, Thanks to our initial presenters for giving us some good background context and um, things that I'm going to build on. I also want to preface my talk with a couple comments. So um, I've been playing soccer since the early 1980s. I've coached soccer. Um, I've been to World Cup games. So this is something that's very personal to me um, as a, both a soccer player and a former coach. Um, and also right as someone who studies um, international politics and not specifically international soccer as kind of an area of emphasis. But certainly soccer or football, depending on what part of the world you come from, is an important example of a global sport. Literally, not only is soccer the beautiful game, it is the most popular, the most important, and many people would argue the best game in the world. And that's why, obviously, many of you are here today, because you feel right, that similar sentiment, that warm feeling right in your heart that our, uh, one of the videos talk about when you think about soccer. So I preface that because I'm going to make a lot of very critical remarks today about FIFA and the World Cup, and I want to be clear that my criticism has nothing to do with soccer as a sport, but rather the way that globalized institutions, particularly an institution like FIFA, and the politics that go into who hosts it, how does the hosting happen, how does the game happen, and what are the issues that go into those events that we should be thinking about and why they matter. And so I want to sort of focus on um, three kind of very broad issues. One has to do with um, human rights issues broadly and how they connect to the World Cup, um, not just the most recent game in Qatar, but kind of as an institution as a whole, okay, which touches on some of the labor issues we heard about, as well as issues of gender rights, gender justice. Um, another one has to do with a kind of far-right politics. We didn't see it as much in this case, but for those of you that are familiar with soccer and follow soccer clubs, right, the soccer hooligans, the ultras, right, are an important part and have a long history and soccer has been long associated both with fascist politics and anti-authoritarian politics in different parts of the world. I and mean, then finally, right, we can't talk about the World Cup without talking about capitalism, particularly globalized and liberal capitalism, because it is kind of the uh, ultimate example of what happens when you take a very pure, enjoyable thing that you could do in your bare feet and turn it into right, a billion dollar, trillion dollar multinational institution. Why should we care about this issue? Um, we heard about the 2022 FIFA Uncovered documentary on Netflix. Um, I'm not plugging anything for Netflix, but if you haven't watched it, um, watch it, because it will give you the background context and why these issues matter in a way that our talks are really kind of scraping the surface on. So we heard right, the issue of migrant rights and issues of labor and construction. Why do these matter? Okay, so roughly about 2 million workers in Qatar are foreign workers, and that makes up about 95% of the labor force. And about roughly a million of those are working in construction projects. So when we talk about right, literally constructing an entire infrastructure for the sport to happen, that is only possible because of right, a huge base of migrant laborers, most of them from South Asia, right? Nepalese, um, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, and a few others. And right, that has been a huge issue looking at the, the kafala, I understand the pronunciation right, the, right, the labor system, so who's sponsoring you to come over and work? And what rights do you have, what freedoms do you have as a migrant worker who's being sponsored by that host country or those host institutions? Right? For a long time, these uh, kind of labor uh, policies were extremely restrictive, so you might have your visa taken, you might have your pay withheld for long periods of time, you might have gotten an initial contract that you're in Kathmandu and someone offers you a job to go for six months or a year and they promise you maybe $500 a month and you end up finding out, oh, I'm only going to get $200 a month. Right? But you're already there. You can't go back home. You can't get your passport back from the company who owns it or who's holding it for you as a laborer, as a migrant worker. Your housing conditions are most likely substandard. Uh, and particularly in the case of Qatar, right, you're working in extremely hot weather conditions. Um, even by right, South Asian standards, even for Nepali, being in Qatar in the middle of the summer is still hot. So you've got all these issues tangled up with, in order to host this, all these things have to happen first. Right? And this was the case if we go back right, with Brazil, when Brazil hosted the World Cup, 
the destruction of uh, communities in the favela where you had hundreds of thousands being pushed out in order to build great infrastructure for um, new game facilities or transportation infrastructure, right? So all these are part of the story about how do we go about building uh, the capacities, right, to host the event. Not watching it as players or as fans, but that infrastructure itself. And so, for example, in 2015, the BBC sent a news crew over with invitations from the Thai government to, you know, to document. So, right, there's all these allegations swirling about human rights violations, workers are dying, unsafe working conditions, people are not being paid. And so they said, okay, come here, right, and invite the international media in to focus on these issues. We have nothing to hide. Go around, talk to people, visit the workers, you know, camps where they're staying, see what's happening here. Um, and so a group of BBC reporters did that, and what they found out was after two days, they were detained. They had been followed from the moment they arrived until the moment they were detained. They had all their equipment seized. They were held for a while and then eventually released, but they did not get any of their equipment back until much later. And when they did get that back, everything had been erased. So all the footage, all the interviews, anything they had done um, disappeared. So the same thing happened not long after with the German news company that was there. You know, so this is all 2015, years before the World Cup is actually taking place. Right? So we have to ask ourselves, um, if these issues are so transparently being addressed in labor reforms in Qatar or you know, through FIFA, uh, why are news crews being detained when they try to speak with migrants sort of without the handlers there? And what kind of political issues come up in those kind of discussions? The other thing we need to think about, so if you will remember, there's a lot of debates about the numbers. Some people say a thousand workers may have died in the projects, you know, in the process of building these projects. Some people say as many as 5,000. The official numbers from the Qatari government are somewhere between four and 500 over the whole process. Those are the numbers they kind of admit that happened. Um, but, you know, if you look at Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, any of the local groups, they all say those numbers are most likely um, quite high, and certainly more than a few hundred individuals. Because even the Indian and the Pali government say a couple hundred migrant workers die every year just in general involved in construction of the projects. So this led, for example, Amnesty International to launch an entire campaign called Pay Up FIFA. That was the uh, Twitter hashtag, trying to get them to set aside 440 or more million dollars, so basically what a team would earn for winning the World Cup, to address, right? So if your husband most likely in this case your husband as a migrant worker dies, what happens to you, you know, if, if you're back home in Kathmandu or in Dhaka or somewhere else? Is someone gonna pay for that? Who's responsible? Right? People says, it's not our problem, right? It's the company who brought those migrants in or it's a third party that contracted. So, right, there was this whole international campaign to try to get funds set aside to address these kind of issues for workers. Um, in December of 2022, so, just um, not too long ago. In response to all these issues, a consortium of about six um, Nepali NGOs got together and released a joint statement to FIFA um, calling on them to set up this fund and to address these issues. And I just want to read you um, a little excerpt from this letter. So they say, as you know, hundreds of thousands of Nepalese have traveled to Qatar since FIFA awarded the World Cup in 2010. Seeking better employment opportunities, they are unable to find a home. They built the stadiums, the roads, the metro lines, and hotels that have made the 2022 World Cup possible. For some, this has provided means to support their families back home. For others, this has led to debt, poverty, and abuse. Our concern for the right of Nepalis and Qatar did not start when FIFA awarded the World Cup and will not end when the tournament is over. But the stories of stolen wages and broken dreams are part of our everyday life. We are too familiar with the image of coffins arriving at Tribhuvan International Airport, which is in Kathmandu. So they go on to say, yes, this World Cup has eventually brought some change. We're talking about labor reforms in Qatar. But it will be too little too late for thousands of our compatriots who have returned home after having lost so much to make your tournament possible. It would be unforgivable for you, right, this is speaking to FIFA, to continue to ignore their plight and deny their right to compensation. The pain suffered over the last decade cannot be reduced to numbers or statistics. They are workers who have lost their savings, children who have lost their education, 
families who have lost their sons, fathers, brothers, and husbands. These losses are real and cannot be dismissed. We therefore call on you, President Infantino, who we just saw uh, giving us his questionably inspirational words, to stop looking the other way while the citizens of our country and all other, national, and all other nationalities are denied their rights. Instead, we call on you to, quote, focus on the workers, right, which is a response to FIFA saying we should focus on the game, not corruption issues inside FIFA. And use all of the financial and political resources at your disposal to set up a program to compensate workers and their families who have lost so much so that others, including FIFA, may win. Right? So to understand these broader global human rights issues, labor migration issues, right, we also want to think about how are people on the ground responding to these kind of issues. Right, so that's just one right, small set of ways we can think about how do we pull apart labor rights issues, migration issues, human rights issues through the lens of the World Cup. Um, we also know, unfortunately, that in Qatar, being gay is illegal. And it's against the law even to advocate for LGBTQ lifestyles, advocacy, any kind of ideas under both various penal codes and other laws. Um, Human Rights Watch and others have documented like, numerous instances of beatings, attacks, detainments, and arrests of LGBTQ individuals, both Qataris as well as foreigners that were visiting in Qatar. In October of 2022, um, human rights activist Peter Kachel briefly held a protest outside of the National Museum in Qatar trying to raise awareness about why is the World Cup hosting this event in a country that has very hostile and anti-LGBTQ politics while claiming, right, we support and affirm everyone's right, right to political freedom, to religious freedom, to whatever um, ideas, right, social categories, FIFA has right, really pretty language about how they respect everyone's right to be themselves. Um, but when you translate those into practice on the ground, they look very different. So just as an example here, we could watch the clip if I had pulled it up. Um, one of the ambassadors from Qatar for the World Cup, Khaled Salman, told the German broadcast uh, ZDF during an interview that homosexuality was haram, so it's forbidden um, in Islam, but also in Qatar specifically. And then he said specifically because he was pressed why, quote, it's a damage in the mind. Right? So this idea of the stigmatization of LGBTQ individuals. And literally watching the interview, right after he said this, one of the handlers from FIFA steps in and says, okay, interview's over. Right? We don't want to raise this as an issue, particularly on a live TV broadcast. Uh, we heard already about the One Love um, armbands. Right? And it's important to note, right, so FIFA's policy is as if your kit, so you know, your boots, your cleats, your outfit, um, doesn't match regulations, then you can be fine. Right? That's standard FIFA practice. And all the teams that we heard about um, from England and others said, okay, we'll accept that fine because we think making the statement is important. So what FIFA did is they changed the rules, and they said, not just a fine, but now your players might get a yellow card. Right? So now you have all these teams saying, well, we want to make the statement, but we can't afford losing our captain, losing our goalkeeper, right? losing our players to make this statement. Right? So FIFA put these teams in a position where they couldn't even express political support and opposition, even just covering an armband, right? because that was too much. But yet FIFA right, had its own no discrimination campaign where it had banners on the field, sometimes before games, sometimes after games. And if you watch the World Cup games, you may have seen these. It was part of a big media publicity campaign that they launched. They were on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. And they had like, this no discrimination campaign that was an important part of their social media messaging, an important part of how they were portraying themselves. They even have right, a very complicated and rigorous FIFA anti-discrimination monitoring system that they put in place. Where, okay, so just to give you some context, according to kind of media scholars, there was 147 million unique impressions on Twitter around the World Cup. And that was a 225% increase from 2018 in Russia. Okay, so a lot of people are online watching, sharing, tweeting. So as part of this initiative, what FIFA did is they scanned, this is from their own report, they scanned 14 million plus comments for abusive, discriminatory, and threatening content so these online social media posts, and found 18,000 
323 comments that were abusive, discriminatory, or threatening that were then reported to social media companies. They also had helped and worked with moderators to hide another 286,895 comments on behalf of the 1,828 players or teams that had opted in to be part of this kind of people program. Right? So on one hand, they care about these issues and they're trying to do things and they're you know, reporting and showing us that, but on the other hand, right, some things are too far. Right? I mean, arm damage is too far. Right? So the arbitrary distinctions about when advocacy is okay right, and when it isn't um, raise a lot of questions about future policies. And even under the same kind of mechanism, right, they have risk assessment. Any big organization, right, they have to look at risk. And some of the risks they specifically identify are right, known far right and other xenophobic groups that might show up at matches, including football related activities and supporters and links to countries and their participating teams, as well as whether or not there's a tendency to commit acts of homophobia or overt sexual abuse based on traditional chance or previous history. And so even in FIBA's own mechanisms, they have things set up that are supposed to prevent these from happening, but yet we can't right, wear a one love on band as a player on our teams. So a lot more we can unpack there, but those just a bit on the second example. Okay, the last one, capitalist exploitation. If you had to guess, how much revenue did FIFA generate from this most recent World Cup? Any guesses? Six billion? Seven hundred million. Seven hundred million. Any other guesses? Yeah. Three billion. Seven point five billion in revenue according to FIFA. Right, compared to 6.4 billion in the last four year cycle. Um, so FIFA does this year, like four year counting between World Cups. So they generate about 6.4 billion in the last round up through the Russia World Cup, 7.5 billion in revenue for this year. That's a lot of money. Why does that matter? Right, if you were watching the news in 2011, 2012, you may have heard, hmm, there's, there's maybe some scandals going on about payments, money, where is it going? Right, maybe a little noise here and there. Um, if you were in Zurich in May of 2015, you would have seen FIFA's headquarters being raided by the FBI, the IRS, and the Joint European Task Force, and FIFA EXCO members. Basically, you know, you've got a car waiting to take them away, you've got security on the other side holding up white blankets, and you've got FIFA executives right, being taken away on unsealed indictments for what turns out, we now know, thanks to New York prosecutors and others, a global international Money laundering, corruption, bribery scandal that falls under the category of RICO, right? Which is what we prosecute international mafia crimes for. Right? Literally every part of FIFA and a majority of their leadership in every part of the world was found either guilty or indicted for accepting bribes, making bribes, accepting gifts, somehow being involved in this whole financial laundering process, right? And importantly, right, this is all being done in the name of promoting soccer and often youth soccer. Right? A lot of this money, the $10 million that was given to South Africa, to the Car from South Africa to the Caribbean, right, it was supposed to be for youth sports development programs, soccer specifically. Major sporting companies, right, Fox News, Adidas, Nike, ISL, Traffic Sports and others, right, were all indicted for being part of this conspiracy, right, paying to either get exclusive licensing rights or hey, here's $40 million, Brazil, let's have your national team wear Nike and not Adidas or right, someone else. In 2012, as these kind of initial scandals were coming out, a sort of independent report was set up um, with a New York reporter, Garcia, who was set up to report and look into these allegations. It became known as the Garcia Report. Over the course of two years, he looked at all these allegations and wrote a 350-page report that basically said, from top to bottom, FIFA is corrupt, and something needs to be done. Well, the leadership of FIFA didn't like that, so they took the report, hid it away, wrote a 42-page summary that had nothing to do with the actual report, and was kind of the exact opposite, and released it to the public. The only reason we now have that report, which came out in 2017, it's because uh, the German newspaper Bild said, hey, we've got a copy, we're going to release it to the public. And then the next day, he says, oh, by the way, here's the original 350 paper. Which told us all the things that have now come out and transpired with the 2015 arrest, 
and with more arrests in 2020, and there were more arrests just recently, in 2022, involving more members, this time of the European Union, and more claims of bribes for hosting. Right, so we heard at least the last four, maybe the last five World Cup games were all picked, so the host was picked based on votes, and those votes were often five. So, as a fan watching these, we might not be aware of any of this, right? But there's a huge amount of money that's involved in making these decisions. And that money, right, is corrupting not just FIFA, but it's also corrupting, right, soccer. Because everything that FIFA does is a reflection on professional soccer, right? Both youth soccer, professional soccer, community soccer, right? We're all tied up in the story. Okay, last little bit, far-right politics. So we didn't see as much of this in Qatar, partly because you don't have as many right, white nationalists living in Qatar for obvious reasons, but also right, the politics there are a little bit different. But there's a long history right, that goes back to the 1936 Olympic Games right, with the Nazis hosting the World Cup in Berlin. Right, we heard about Argentina, Mussolini did this in Italy as well, right, using the national team as a way to promote nationalist politics and nationalist politics. Um, there were over 100 arrests in Paris during the sort of last bit of the World Cup this most recent time, particularly around the game between France and Morocco. Dozens of arrests of far-right group members, uh, neo-Nazi groups, right? Some of them who were going out in the neighborhoods looking to find Moroccan fans or supporters, right, to attack them on the streets. You had 1,300 English and Welsh fans who the UK Home Office contacted them and said, you've had a prior violation for violence at football games, give us your passport, you will not be able to travel out of the country until after the World Cup's over because we don't want you going there and causing violence at these games, right? So even state governments are now intervening into some of these politics because of right, these soccer hooligans, particularly the ultras, um, which are kind of like, we'll face you in the street because our team lost, or maybe even because our team won, because we're in a good mood, right? In Spain, same thing, right? We had neo-Nazis and fascists, these ultra um, hooligans getting in fights with Moroccan fans, right? On Telegram and other channels, we've got posts about, for example, from the Ultras Not Reds group, one of the far-right groups, you know, posting to far-right Spanish youth, saying things like, refugees not welcome, Europe for the Europeans, message to Moroccans, death to Islam, right? Spraying things like, Muerta Islam in Spanish on the walls, right? Death to Islam and calling people out, right, to defend their communities and defend their streets from violence, right, the violence supposedly being the violent Moroccan fans. Right? So all of these different issues, right, all tangled up when we think about the World Cup at a global level, right? This is an international institution that touches every part of the world. There's maybe Antarctica is the only place that doesn't have a soccer team. Anymore. Maybe even the research labs there, right, play pick up soccer. In their so if, if we want to think about how do global politics matter in the world today, right, FIFA and the World Cup gives us a great way to start to unravel some of these different stories. Thank you.